Open your Bibles to Psalm 119, please, starting in verse 105. And while you are turning, I'm going to ask you to keep our brother Aaron Johnson in prayer. Uh, he is in a rough place physically and emotionally. But the beauty is, where can you go to hide from the Lord? Can you go to a dark hole to hide from him? Nope. Can you go to a mountaintop and get away from him? Nope. Be praying for Aaron. Uh, since his mom died, he's been struggling emotionally and uh, having some issues with the courts again. And uh, talked to his dad today, and Aaron needs prayer. So, Psalm 119, verse 105. Before we jump into this, I have to throw out a disclaimer. When Psalm 119 was written, was it written to 21st century Americans? Who is it written to? Ancient Jewish people, the Hebrews, Israel, right? Who wrote it? Wasn't it? Isn't it around the time of David? It's, it's an ancient poem. When were the prophets canonized into Scripture? About 500 B.C. is when you had the Tanakh canonized. This would have been around the time of David, right? So 3,000 years ago. 1000 BC was was the book of Romans part of the word at that point hmm. was the book of John part of the word of God at that time how about the Psalms was that it? no they didn't even have the, the psalm the scroll of the Psalms yet so when he said your word is a lamp for my foot and a light to my path what is he talking about? Right, right here, the first five books of Scripture. Because that's what they had. They had the Torah, they had Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's it. And that was enough, wasn't it? It would have been enough if that's all that he gave us. Dainu. But then he gave us the writings. Would have been enough to have had the Torah and the writings. Dainu. But then he gave us the prophets. That would have been enough to have the Tanakh, right? Dainu. Because for those who love him, we will see Yeshua on every page of the Tanakh. But what else did he give us? He gave us the he gave us the Messiah to demonstrate and to live out and to show us how the Word of God looks in a holy life. Dainu. But then he wrote it down and gave us the Gospels. Dainu. It would have been enough. But then he gave us the epistles. Dainu. To explain how the life of Yeshua integrated and looked with the Torah of God. Dainu, he could have left it there, but then he gave us the book of Revelation. What is the book of Revelation? The book of Revelation is showing how God interacts with his creation through his Torah, through his commandments. When he holds the world accountable and takes us through the judgment prescribed in his Torah. And then takes us and restores us as he promised us in his Torah 
and makes us one in Messiah. Dainu. That's the Holy Scriptures, guys. But back when Psalm 119 was written, the Word was the Torah of God. Your Word is a lamp for my foot and a light on my path. How is that so? Because doesn't it teach you how to live out your life? Doesn't the Word of God teach you what you should and should not do? Why, do, why does a loving father give his children boundaries and rules? It's to keep them from getting hurt or killed, right? A loving father says, don't go play in the street. Dad, you get a pass. <laughs> it's a shame Will never took that advice to go, no, never mind. Uh, <laughs> No, a loving father says, don't do these things. You will get hurt or you will get destroyed. Something we tell Yoki, something I told I, I and Zekwa as they grew up, over and over, what happens if you don't do what you're told? Somebody gets hurt or killed every time. What happens when we don't walk out our life the way God has told us to. Somebody is hurt and somebody dies spiritually. Thy word is a lamp for my foot and a light to my path. This is not mystical. My whole life, I'd hear preachers preach about this and it would be, well... The law of Christ is about love, and so now we can know how we're supposed to walk out our lives because now we can be brought near. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's always been salvation by grace through faith, right? Am I wrong? It's always been that way. So if you have been saved by grace through faith and there's always been a remnant of God, ergo... If we are walking our lives out according to his word in faith because he gives us the grace to do so in putting his spirit in us after having washed us in the blood of Messiah, then you're never far away from him in the first place. Why do you need to be brought near to walk it out? If we're saved by the blood and water of Messiah, we are saved, Ephesians 10 says, for the appointment of good works. In other words, to obey him. People want to know how to walk out their lives. It's very simply the way he showed you. You want to know what the will of God is for your life? to obey him. And yet we buy all of these books from, what's the guy from Houston with the hair and the teeth? He just wrote a book about the power of I am. Joel, Joel. yeah. Mr. Ovaltine. Uh, don't worry, I will pick on other authors. I don't just pick on one denomination. It's kind of a rule in Messianic Judaism. You pick on everybody. And you laugh at yourself. Uh, Joel was busy telling everybody, you have God in you, so therefore you are the power of God. You can make things happen. And so he started to combine taking scripture out of context and com almost combining it with this, what is it? The, the power of suggestion or a law of attraction, that's what these wackles call it. 
combining scripture taken out of context with law of attraction, and now we have this doctrine of prosperity. That God is your slave that is supposed to bless you and, and prosper you. Wait a minute. How many of us read the parasha this week? Did you read the part where he says, I brought you out of Egypt, you are my slaves? Isn't he the king? Doesn't that make him sovereign over the subjects? It says he's the king. He's not a populist leader. It says he's the king, which means his word goes. We are to be the subjects. We are to be subservient to him. Does he owe us anything? No, we owe him our eternity. Your word, your Torah, is a lamp for my foot and a light for my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it that I will observe your righteous rulings. Now this starts to make sense, doesn't it? What are his righteous rulings? His commandments, his Torah. The, your word, O oh God. I am very much distressed. Adonai, give me life in keeping with your word. Always goes back to his word, his Torah. Our problem is, and we're all guilty of this, myself included, our problem is we take the word of God and we make it mean what we want it to say. Isn't that a form of rewriting scripture? Isn't that what the Mormons did and the Jehovah Witnesses? So we take scripture and re we rewrite it to make it say what we want it to say. We're adding to scripture, guys, and we're taking away from scripture. There's a curse for that. Tonight, we're getting into Acts 10 in our study. Everyone wants to use it as a proof for what we can and cannot eat. Drives me nuts. Because it's a passage that has nothing to do with food. It's a passage that has to be understand, understood through its Jewish context. The God of Israel, correct, is the one that gave the revelation in Acts 10? To whom? Who is Peter? Was Peter a, was Peter a Baptist? Was he a Lutheran? He was a Jew. Correction, he is a Jew. Because our God is not the God of the dead, is he? He's the God of the living. Peter's alive in his presence right now. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Yeshua himself said, my father is not the God of the dead. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're alive in his presence. We're going to look at this and we're going to see and you're going to know how this passage has been turned and perverted and twisted and made to say something it's not saying. No, we're to be giving our, we're to be keeping his word. What does it mean to be keeping God's word? Does it mean only to be walking it out? No, it means to be preserving it and protecting it as well. Keeping it from being polluted by this and by this and by this and by all of that. We have a responsibility to correctly interpret and teach the word of God. And if we screw it up, guess what? There is judgment for that. And that should frighten us. That's why Paul says not everyone should aspire to teach. I'm only teaching because I was told I have to. Please accept my mouth's voluntary offerings, Adonai, and teach me what? 
your rulings, the commandments of God, his Torah. I am continually taking my life in my hands, and yet I haven't forgotten your Torah. What does that mean? Remember Cornelius, the guy we're going to be reading about tonight? He was a Roman, Roman commander of some sort. He commanded between 100 and 999 troops. He was a warrior. In order to be a proselytite to Judaism, somebody who feared the God of Israel and gave to the synagogue and gave alms to the Jewish people and to maintain his position, he had to have been really good at being a commander in the Roman army. He had to have been really useful in battle because otherwise they wouldn't have put up with him. But, there you go, man. But, he acted in faith. He stepped out in faith. He took his life in his own hands. And he hadn't forgotten God's Torah. And what happened? God blessed him for it. That's New Testament, folks. <laughs> the wicked have set a trap for me. They always do. Yet I haven't strayed from your precepts. See, this could be prophesying of Messiah. Think about it. The wicked have set a trap for me. Weren't the, the Torah teachers and the parashim constantly setting traps for Yeshua? Traps with what? Traps with trying to get him trapped legally in God's law. How are you going to trap the Son of God whose very spirit wrote the law of God how are you going to trap him in God's law? It's not going to happen. But because we didn't listen to Moses, we didn't recognize Yeshua. And because we aren't listening to Yeshua, we don't recognize Moses. The wicked have set a trap for me, yet I haven't strayed from your precepts. Guys, it doesn't matter what the world is planning and how, how they're laying for us. It doesn't change the fact that God's Torah is eternal and he's commanded you to walk in it. He's commanded you to live it out, not out here externally, but in here, which is a whole lot harder. It's a whole lot more difficult because... Let's face it, anybody can put on airs. Humility is an easy thing to fake. People do it all the time. But to actually walk that out and keep yourself clean in here and in here before a holy God, constantly going back to Yeshua, that's something else. And guess what? People are going to hate you for it. Some of us people already do hate us for it. Some of us, it's just natural to hate us. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's so easy. No. Uh, people have a hard time with it. Why? Is it because of us? Yeshua said it's because of him. So if people are harassing you, if people are laying in wait for you, if they're laying traps for you, rejoice. Rejoice. Because isn't that what they did to Yeshua? Isn't that what they did to the disciples? If that's what they're doing to you, rejoice, because you must be doing something right. I take your instruction as a permanent heritage. And what kind of heritage? What's the word for instruction in, in Hebrew? What's that? Torah. Torah is the word that means instruction. <laughs> I 
I have taken your instruction as a permanent heritage. I have taken your instruction, O oh God, as a permanent heritage. All of it. Do you know how many Jewish people I have met who claim to be a Jewish person? They claim to be Jewish in religion, not just ethnicity, but then they buy into evolution. Wait a minute. What's part of that permanent heritage? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You deny that, you're denying the whole of Torah. Well, we must be sophisticated. No, we don't. Yeshua didn't say, be sophisticated. He didn't say to be a pfud. Do you know what I mean by pfud? Mercy does. A pfud is a PhD. He didn't say to be a PhD. He said to be a child. Listen, I've been dealing with a five-year-old all week. I've been telling him, listen, kid, you've got 22 more years of your brain developing. Shush. <laughs> Desist and know that I'm your dad. Sound familiar, dad? <laughs> no. We're to be as children, innocent children before God. We're supposed to be poor in spirit and humble. We're not supposed to be putting on airs. When we have to put on airs, that's when we have to be throwing out the false humility stuff too. It gets us in even more trouble. I take your instructions as a permanent heritage because it is a, the joy of my heart. Oh, the law was so heavy and burdensome. No, no. Wait a minute. And I have heard preachers preach that, that the law was so burdensome that God didn't want us to be burdened by it anymore and be under it and crushed by it. So he gave us Yeshua. Wait a minute. Is, is God lying to us here in Numbers or uh, Psalm 119, 111? Because God inspired this, right? Did God inspire Psalm 119? Yeah. So who's lying? God, when he says, I take your instruction as my permanent heritage because it is the joy of my heart, is the law of God a joy? Is God lying there? Or are all of those people who say that the God's law is burdensome and too heavy a weight, are they lying? My God is true. My God is holy. My God doesn't lie. In fact, his very word says the problem, the defect, is with his children, not with him. See, I'm not even saying that some of those preachers who teach that aren't his children because it's not my place. I can wonder, how can you call him your father and deny his word. But ultimately, it's between him and them. I can use discernment, and I can say, I'm throwing out everything this guy says, and I'm going to turn him off. No. God, your law, your instruction, your Torah is the joy of my heart. And what, what is the last, what is the last, what does Psalm 112, 119 verse 112 say? I have resolved to what? Obey your laws forever at every step. Oh, he's a legalist. He's a legalist. No, no. He's not talking about how you're getting saved. What he's talking about is, now that you're saved, now I'm going to walk in your ways, oh God. How is that legalistic? That's biblical. You have been saved for the purpose of glorifying God. How do you glorify God? 
by obeying his word, by obeying what he commanded you, by walking out your ways, your days, according to his commandments. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Does that mean that we're going to see way out there and know all of the things that are going to happen to us? It has nothing to do with that. What it means is we get to obey him. Did you hear that? We get to obey him. Hallelujah! We get to obey the God of Jacob, the one who spoke and there was a son, the one who spoke and there was darkness, the one who holds your very atoms together and keeps them from flying off. CERN is busy looking for some God particle that holds everything together. Listen, quit looking for the God particle and look at the Son of God. For by him and through him and to him are all things, right? And Hebrew says he's the one that holds everything together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are here to worship you tonight because it's your Shabbat. And thank you, Father, for letting us be here. Thank you for letting us be in your presence. Thank you that we don't have to try to conjure you up. Oh, come down, come. No, Lord, you said you'd be here, and so we are here. Thank you, Father. We just ask that if we are filthy before you, if we are unpleasing to you, Lord, have mercy on us and wash us clean so that we can be pleasing to you. Anoint us so that our worship of you will be pleasing to you and useful to you. Father, anoint us so that the word that is about to be taught tonight doesn't fall on shallow soil that doesn't fall where the demons can eat it up and twist it and warp it into something disgusting. Help us, Father, because we are needy and without you we are lost. Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach, Amen.